bit of young, dumb, and ignorant kids. I was one of them, stuck around lingering. Said that it's a privilege to meet you in person, and she took my hand, said it's good to meet you too. And when I'm out of school, ask me what I'm gonna do. I had to think about it, but truth is I knew that it was something for the youth and shit. Truly, I'd probably be a teacher if the music didn't make enough to make me wanna gamble on its sustenance. And that's why I'm writing this to tell y'all from a scholar. When I grow up, I wanna be just like Yuri Kojiyama. Holla, swear to my Kasamas. When I grow up, I wanna be just like Yuri Kojiyama. And if she ever hear this, it's an honor. Cause when I grow up, I wanna be just like Yuri Kojiyama. Tama, serve the people proper. And when I grow up, I wanna be just like Yuri Kojiyama. up in life magazine you were sitting front seat for malcolm's last speech saw the first man with the shotgun two more came to get the job done now who would have thought that it'd be you holding him i wonder what you felt when his eyes were going dim and if he never died would we know that he exists or would he been the leader that we always seem to miss now there's no taking back whatever happens in our midst you remind me that it's more than just the martyr in a myth you could have said it quits many times ever since and you find there will always be a reason for the fist the last one to hold him could have been somebody else you'd still be remembered for the people that you helped they said it keep trying but never Losing hope, revolutionaries die, but the revolution don't, and it won't, and I put that on my mama. Cause when I grow up, I wanna be just like Yuri Kojiyama. Holla, swear to my Kasamas. When I grow up, I wanna be just like Yuri Kojiyama. And if she ever hear this, it's an honor. Cause when I grow up, I wanna be just like Yuri Kojiyama. Comma, serve the people proper. When I grow up, I wanna be just like Yuri Kojiyama. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for spending time with us tonight. My name is Jun Lee Kim. Um, I graduated from Yale in 1985. Um, and I want uh, to say uh, thank you um, for being here. Um, as we mark the murder of Vincent Chin 40 years ago, uh, we are again witnessing a horrific rise in anti-Asian hate in this country. Um, if Vincent were alive, he would be celebrating his 40th wedding anniversary today. Um, in spite of this sadness and outrage, I am uh, sustained by some rays of hope out there. And two of those rays of hope will be speaking to us tonight. Uh, so I'm grateful that we can all come together and share some time as a community. This evening's events are sponsored by the Association of Asian American Yale Alumni and the Asian American Cultural Center at Yale. I'd like to introduce Juliana Yi, Assistant Dean at Yale and Director of the Asian American Cultural, Ameri Asian American Cultural Center to say a few words. Juliana. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Jun Lee. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on what time zone you're joining us from. As Jun Lee mentioned, I'm Juliana Yi. I use she, her pronouns, and I have the pleasure and honor of serving as an assistant dean of Yale College and director of the Asian American Cultural Center at Yale, which we, we refer to as the AACC here on campus. Established in 1981, the AACC is the third oldest of its kind in the United States on a college campus. And it is our pleasure and honor to co-host this evening's event with AYA, the Asian Association for Asian American Yale Alumni, uh, which Liz will um, mention a few words about shortly. It feels so good to be here in community with all of you in this way, holding virtual space and before we dive into the rest of our program for this evening, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the lands on which we are settled upon. We are coming from many places and spaces today, and we want to acknowledge the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of Indigenous peoples who have been here since time immemorial, and to recognize that we must continue to build our solidarity and kinship with native peoples across the Americas and across the globe. 
Yale University and the Asian American Cultural Center is located in New Haven, Connecticut, and acknowledges that indigenous peoples and nations, including the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Skatacoke, Golden Hill Pagasit, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. Land acknowledgements have become somewhat common ways to give a moment of thought to the histories, needs, contributions, and lands of indigenous and native peoples who Turtle Island has always remained home. However, these acknowledgements can also sometimes seem like a checkbox or a routine measure. Thus, I just wanna invite all of us to take a moment, and I can see some of, the, some of you are doing this in the chat box, to just reflect on the relationship between you and the lands in which you are seated or standing upon and really commit to learning more about the history of the land on which you settle upon and the connections between and across struggles and people on these lands. I also encourage you to do some individual, individual searching about the land and the indigenous history of the space you call home, which might be different from where you're currently located. And so just really engage in relationality with past and present beings. And I know that's something that I continue to do as someone who is fairly new to New Haven um, and originally from the homelands of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, which I'm quite jealous that Jeff is in Singapore, close to where my motherland is. So I'm, I'm hoping that um, you're having a great time and eating lots of great food too. Um, so with that, I will pass it off to Liz Lee to uh, introduce our wonderful guest speakers this evening. Great, thanks, Jean Yi. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Liz Lee. I am the immediate past president of AYA and uh, want to acknowledge some of the alumni that we have in the room who founded AYA. Uh, you know, I guess recent decades ago, but we, we have always had a very, very vibrant Asian American Alumni Association. Um, we were just not officially incorporated, um, you know, until uh, the, the late 90s. And so we owe a lot to folks like Grant Din and um, Julie Wong, and I, I don't I, I, I don't see everyone. So I am uh, sorry if, if I missed you, but um, we're always pleased to be collaborating with Dean Yi um, because she brings um, such such a great uh, spirit and, and um, energy to, to the AACC supporting the students and making sure that um, we have meaningful relationships um, you know, with uh, current students once we leave campus. And so thanks for collaborating always. Um, and yes, uh, I won't keep us um, you know, out of the program any longer. Um, I have the distinct um, honor of introducing um, our speakers tonight, Paula Yu, um, who is class of 91. And I I'm sorry, I had it down, but uh, were you Pearson or Gavin? J.E. -E. Oh, I am so sorry. <laughs> um, apologies um, to to all those rivalries out there. And then, um, of course, Jeff Yang, our, our Crimson brother, who has um, showed up in, in full regalia tonight. Um, we invited the, the Harvard folks, too, so I, I hope that there there are some, some folks here. And um, yeah, really just pleased to have this conversation. Um, some of you guys might have been in Detroit last week um, when um, many members of the community were uh, commemorating um, Vincent's life. And so um, we thought it would be an important conversation to to talk about, um, you know, how we tell our stories and um, to really, you know, retell Vincent's story um, and also, um, you know, reclaim it for us, right? Um, I think, you know, Paula and, and Jeff have, have done um, such a great favor for, for our community, making sure that we don't ever forget Vincent's story. Um, I think, you know, some people grow up um, not knowing about him until they go to college sometimes, right? And so uh, Paula's written a whole book about it. And, uh, you know, Jeff has this this new book about Asian American pop history. Um, so I want him to talk a little bit about why it was so important that he had um, um, Paula also contribute to that. So I have my copy too. Um, it's a little blurred out, but hopefully if you have your, your copy, uh, follow along tonight. And, um, you know, with that, um, I'll, I'll pass the mic to, to Paula to start her reading. Okay. 
Well, hi, thank you so much for having me and, and hello to everyone. And um, it's really good to see all the Yaleys here tonight. Um, and if anyone's in JE, yay. <laughs> but um, what I'm gonna do is uh, before I start reading, I just wanna, because I'm not sure how familiar people are with the Vincent Chin case and Jeff and I will be talking about it more, but just uh, I'll just read you a quick short thing. Uh, it's from the back of my book, uh, From a Whisper to a Rallying Cry, The Killing of Vincent Chin and the Trial that Galvanized the Asian American Movement, published last year by Norton Young Readers, uh, uh, which is the children's imprint for W.W. W. Norton and Company. Um, so it says here, America in 1982, Japanese car companies are on the rise and believed to be putting American auto workers out of their jobs. Anti-Asian American sentiment simmer, especially in Detroit. A bar fight turns fatal, leaving Vincent Chin, a Chinese American man beaten to death at the hands of two white men, auto worker Ronald Evans and his son, Michael Nitz. From a whisper to a rallying cry is an examination of the killing and the trial and the verdicts that followed when Ebens and Nitz pled guilty to manslaughter and received only a $3,000 fine and three years probation, the lenient sentence sparked outrage in the Asian American community. This outrage galvanized the Asian American movement and paved the way for the first federal civil rights trial on behalf of an Asian American. So that's the basics, and we'll go into more of this in my conversation with Jeff. But uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, they were supposed to be married today. Uh, Vincent was supposed to be married on June 28th. And I wanna just uh, read a little bit. Uh, this is, I'm gonna tell you what was on the wedding invitation. It said, Mrs. Lily F. Chin and Mr. and Mrs. Ping Quen Wong request the honor of your presence at the marriage of their children, Vincent and Vicky, on Monday, the 28th of June, 1982. Now, a lot of times when people talk about Vincent Chin, a lot is a lot of attention is given towards his killing to the shockingly lenient sentencing uh, after the manslaughter verdict, and then the two trials that happened and the aftermath and how Vincent became a symbol for Asian American civil rights and uh, fight a symbol to fight against anti-Asian racism. But one of the things I do in my book, especially because it's written for young adults, it's written for high school students, I wanted to celebrate his life because I think one of the problems when we talk about racism in this country and civil rights, a lot of times the people who unfortunately lost their lives to racism become icons or become martyrs and it dehumanizes them. And in a way that is kind of racist because we, we lose who they originally were. And one thing I do wanna bring up is that, uh, one thing that really spoke to me in my research was that, did you know Vincent Chin wanted to be a writer? He actually, he used to write poems, he was a bookworm, and uh, I just thought that was really beautiful. So I'm going to read you a little bit about that. So let me just go to my part. Okay. So I'm reading to you from a chapter, and it's from the point of view of his best friend, Gary, who uh, had known Vincent since they were in the first grade. Dozens of gaily wrapped wedding presents were arriving at the doorstep of Lily and Vincent's house in Oak Park. Some packages were postmarked as far away as from China. Theirs was to be a big wedding with more than 400 guests, not just from all over America, but also from Asia. On the morning of June 29, 1982, Gary Koivu put on his formal suit. It was still fairly new because he had bought it last year for Vincent's father's funeral. He had planned to wear his one nice suit again for Vincent and Vicky's wedding. But instead, he was now wearing it to another funeral of his best friend. Gary missed Vincent every day. I felt a great sense of loss, he said. He was a good friend, and I'd known him for over 20 years, so we had a lot of history, and we shared memories. Gary and Vincent became lifelong friends when they first met in first grade at Cortland Elementary School in Highland Park. He's standing in front of the class, the teacher's introducing him. He looked so scared, he remembered. Of course, a new school, a new country for him, sort of understandable. We became friends. The two first graders walked back and forth to school together every day, past the giant elm trees that lined their street. In the early 1960s, Highland Park was the American dream come to life with Gary and Vincent playing football on the front lawn while the local milkman dropped glass bottles of cold cream into the milk chute built into the side of Gary's childhood home. Gary and Vincent were inseparable. They hung out together all the time, watching their favorite TV shows, playing board games, and reading Superman and Archie comic books on rainy days. 
They ran track and took violin lessons together. Gary remembered going to Vincent's house for dinner and eating Chinese food for the first time in his life. Now I'm gonna skip ahead because I do wanna have time for our discussion. But basically uh, when I interviewed Gary, he told me that they were opposites tracked. And Gar Gary is very shy, very quiet. It's like pulling teeth to get him to talk. And Vincent, the minute he met you, you were his best friend. He had a great smile and he just made you feel as if he had known you his whole life. So they were very much opposites attract. But whenever they went to the library together, Vincent could be just as quiet, if not quieter, than Gary. Visiting the library was one of their favorite pastimes together when they were in the seventh grade. Gary would check out the nonfiction books while Vincent would wander the fiction section. Vincent was a bookworm, Gary recalled. He would take a couple stacks of novels, thick books, he said. I'd help him carry them home. He read all through his life. You would always see him with a book in his car, in his house, always reading in his spare time. And then the rest of my chapter goes on about how, as young men, they still were friends. They often would hang out together. They would go fishing. Uh, Gary would hang out at the bar of, of the Golden Star Restaurant, the Chinese restaurant where Vincent worked, and would hang out until his shift ended so they could go out for a beer. And I'm going to read you the last few paragraphs of this chapter. On Sundays, Vincent would visit Gary at his apartment on Cass Lake to go fishing in a rowboat. rowboat. We didn't catch much, catch much, Gary remembered of their fishing days. I think I caught a pike. We just enjoyed being out on the water. He remembered and impressed Vincent joking about how he wanted to take their fish home to cook it. Whether or not we caught anything, we had fun. Gary never forgot the night when Vincent stopped by his apartment after his restaurant shift ended so they could hang out. They watched an old black and white movie on TV because Vincent was a fan of classic cinema. We used to discuss old movies, Gary said. He loved watching them. I fell asleep watching the movie. The next day, Gary was amused to learn that Vincent had stayed awake to finish the movie so he could tell his friend what happened. <laughs> he told me the ending, Gary said, smiling. Things like that I missed. He's the only one that I knew who grew up with me and was still friends with. Those moments of loyal friendship were what Gary missed the most about Vincent. I felt terrible, he said. For someone that I knew for 20 years, was very close with and had a lot in common, a part of me was lost. And now I'm gonna wrap by reading Vincent's first and only published poem, because as you know, he was an aspiring uh, poet. And I wanted to read this in honor of their 40th, what would have been their 40th wedding anniversary. He wrote this poem called Vicky. It was published in the classified section on Valentine's Day, 1979 in the Detroit Free Press. And when I read it, you'll see it's very hard on your sleeve, very sentimental, but he had a good sense of rhyme and scheme and scansion and meter. Uh, he, he really was talented. Vicky, my love for you is like a fire that glows in my heart, so bright when we're together so very dim when we're apart. The fire will last forever and my love will never die as long as we have each other, as long as we both try. There is no life without you. There is no joy or laughter. There is no brightness, no warmth all the mornings after. So stay with me and we'll face the tomorrows to find if our love can overcome the sorrows. Remember me always for my love for you is true. There isn't anyone else. I love you. Happy Valentine's Day. Love, Vincent. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> oh, Paula. Uh, it's very, very challenging to follow up uh, that in particular. I, I'm actually um, tearing up a little bit, not least because beyond simply a statement of uh, his his heart, uh, it, it is a, a statement of what he missed, what we miss when we don't know what lies ahead of us in the road. And uh, that, that aspirational quality, that sense of hope for the future, that, that feeling that this was just the beginning of his journey is something which, I mean, when I was his age, certainly I felt. I'm, I'm assuming I'm somewhere in the middle of my journey now, knock on wood, not too far uh, beyond that. Um, but it's that sense of, of hope and earnestness, that sense of innocence in a lot of ways that his passing, uh, his passing kind of knocked aside for Asian America more broadly. And 
Um, I'm going to share a little bit of, of the context for RISE, uh, our book, and why it was so important to, uh, as Liz noted, include Paula's work and, and Vincent's story in the book itself. Uh, the book is a pop history, not because it's a history of popular culture, although it's also that uh, of Asian America, but because it's a popular history of Asian America. It's a, it's a story that's intended to be about how we lived and grew and came to a point where we could see each other and see ourselves. And most of the book sits in these three decades of the 1990s, 2000s, and 2010s. And I think a lot of us who are on this call probably well, certainly remember those decades, but we're probably also coming of age or part of the process of building our community, our culture, our sense of ourselves during that three decade period. And it's a particularly important one because of all that happened in the decades that preceded it, uh, beginning actually in 1968. And uh, I, I think what I'll do is this, I'm gonna read first a little bit from the book, just from the, the section uh, the first chapter of the book is called Before. It, it really does kind of compress all of the history of Asians in America <laughs> into uh, one chapter. And then we have one chapter each on each of those three decades we focus on, the 90s, the 2000s, and 2010s. And then a final chapter called Beyond, which really looks at the future. And Paula's piece, uh, we, we actually included a graphic essay, a collaboration between herself and Louis Chin, that is almost like the meta story of her book inside this book. That is, it talks about how she uh, came to this point of telling Vincent's story about her own early career days in Detroit and about some of the reasons why Vincent's story remains resonant. Um, but, uh, and I'll quickly just show you actually that piece because it's, it's really quite lovely. Um, it's a part of how we actually tell the story. We, we wanted to ensure that it was as graphic as possible. So we included graphic essays, uh, a lot of them first person from people who were direct observers of or part of really kind of critical moments in the history of, of our community's evolution. And, uh, and of course, Paula's work was, was a, a critical part of that. So her, uh, her graphic essay is, is called uh, why Vincent Shin still matters. And of course, that's a big part of what we're talking about today. But uh, the section I wanted to read actually is at the very, very beginning of the book. And it just talks about some of the reasons why the galvanizing force of Vincent's death played such a big role ultimately in bringing who we are as Asian Americans into focus. And um, I'm not gonna read much of it. I, I wanna I show some images from the book as well afterwards but it, it kind of contextualizes the ways in which we went from being a kaleidoscopic uh, and in, in many ways disconnected set of cultures that converged. Uh, so this is the, the very beginning of the book and it starts like this. Where do we begin? Or rather, or rather where, sorry, where do we begin? Or rather, when did we begin? If you go by the history books, Asians have been in America since the 19th century when Chinese immigrants toiled to build the infrastructure of America's manifest destiny and fed the hungry bellies of gold-struck prospectors and after hours took a turn themselves at panning the glittering streams of California. If you go by the records that never seem to make it to the textbooks, uh, um, Asians have been in America since Filipino slaves jumped ship from Spanish galleons in Louisiana in the 1760s, where they built secret villages in the swamplands, hid from their kidnappers, fished to survive, and eventually were recruited to defend a young America from a new British invasion in 1812. If you crawl through the weird fringes of antiqu antiquarianism, you'll find people who claim that a Chinese admiral landed his fleet of ships on the east coast of the United States in 1421 that Japanese fishermen discovered America in the 13th century, that wandering Buddhist monks floated to a place called Fusang, California maybe, in AD 499. And if you dive down into evolutionary anthropology, you'll probably read about the Bering Land Bridge crossed by ancient Asian migrants who trekked over from Siberia some 16,000 years ago and spread out all across what is now America. But none of these moments, real or fake, really answer the question of when 
Asian America began because none of those protagonists in these journeys ever thought of themselves as Asian. After all, Asia is a huge landmass made up of wildly disparate states, most of whom had spent centuries trying to kill each other or alternatively trying hard to resist killing each other. It's difficult to imagine that these remarkably different peoples might choose to identify as a collective group, which makes the term Asian meaningless in Asia anyway. But this is America. And in America, not only does Asian mean something, we can pinpoint when that meaning came into being and where. In May, 1968, in the apartment of two grad students, Yuji Ichioka and Emma G at 2005 Hearst Avenue in Berkeley, California. So I'm gonna stop there and just note that that moment in May, 1968, uh, the May that we still celebrate now as Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, that was the, the moment in which Yuji Ichioka and Emma G and a group of other uh, diaspora students in, at Berkeley and elsewhere in the, uh, the Bay Area came together to form a group called AAPA, the Asian American Political Alliance. And they did so literally because they wanted a banner to march under in order to uh, come together in solidarity with black students who were seeking the release of Black Panther Huey Newton from, from uh, jail. And it's a, a reminder that Asian America in its first breaths, this idea of a pan-ethnic solidarity, uh, not just across our own individual lines within Asian America, but across racial lines as well, solidarity with Black Americans. This is where the very beginning of Asian America began as an act of solidarity and an act of resistance. So from 1968 until the early 80s, a lot happened. You know, we built a lot of infrastructure. We created a lot of the organizations that we even now look back to as the establishment in some ways of Asian America. Uh, we constructed you know, enclaves, we created Asian American studies, we built a lot of our, our first institutions, and even today continue to teach and expand people's recognition of what it means to be Asian American. But again, it wasn't until the early 80s, it wasn't until really 1982, that the sense that Asian America had a purpose beyond simply being a, uh, a container for the passions that we were beginning to express came together. And, and that was the, uh, the unifying force of horror at this atrocity of the killing of Vincent Chin. It really was the, the moment that uh, created the first true pan-ethnic, pan-Asian, Asian-American movement. And without it, I think we wouldn't be looking back today together as a group. We would be still, I think, uh, looking at one another as, as kind of, again, those sort of disparate colors in a, a kaleidoscope of, of difference without that sense of common purpose. Um, so one of the things that actually the book does in, in trying to show how that moment and moments like it brought us together is we, we go back and, and we look at the different beats over the course of time that helped us see one another and see ourselves. And, like I said, a lot of those are about lived culture and pop culture. And Liz, I, I just wanted to um, share out, you know, that deck uh, so you can see a little bit of what the book looks like. Um, if you could put it up, and then uh, then I'll, I'll just sort of. Um, this is a, a spread called the Propaganda Family Tree, and it actually is very meaningful to what we're talking about today because it shows how the origin points of a lot of the stereotypes, a lot of the sense of uh, projections that non-Asians have put upon us because we haven't been able to tell our own stories are rooted in acts of war, are rooted in acts of expulsion and exclusion, right? You know, it's the wartime propaganda, the um, uh, editorial cartoons telling, you know, Chinese and later, you know, other groups to leave. It's rooted in labor statements that were attempting to force out competition. Those images actually expanded outwards and became part of the infrastructure of storytelling in America. They became a part of our popular culture and our unconscious. And even now, to this day, when you see a lot of these images pop up in Hollywood, you have to think back and say, the reason why they're here is because of those propaganda images 
went into cartoons and comics and filtered out throughout the way we tell stories across this giant enterprise we call, again, the media and entertainment in America. Go to the next slide. Um, <laughs> this is just a, actually, it's my favorite spread on the, the deck. It's, it's uh, in, in the book, actually. It's called Stuff Asians Like. A reminder in a lot of ways that a lot of the things that we own that make us feel Asian aren't actually Asian originally. They're, they're things that we encounter in America. They're things that are part of the immigrant journey that we gather along the way. And by consuming these things, in some ways, we consume America and America in, in response kind of consumes us. Um, so if you, you see here, <laughs> everything from Costco to Adidas Slides uh, to Almond Roca and Toblerone, um, Celine Dion and oranges. Like there are a lot of, this is a, a list of, and a visual of all the things that Asians like that aren't Asian, but that we've made Asian. And it really underscores the fact that this is meant to be a story that's an American story, right? That the Asian American story is an American story at heart. Next slide. Um, this is uh, something we call the Asian American Atlas. It's something that Phil Yu put together. Uh, my my co-authors, Phil Yu and, and Philip Wong. Um, so Phil, uh, essentially just wanted to lay out some of the places where if you wanted to look at Asian America uh, on a map, literally all the places that have helped shape our history, um, this is this is a starter point. And of course, Detroit and Justice Vincent Chin is right in the center there. Um, next slide, please. And then this is uh, a, an incredible set of running pieces that um, Sojung Kim McCarthy did for us, where we visualize some of the, the folks who were the founding fathers of our own community in a lot of ways, both good and ill. Not all of them are heroes, uh, but they're the people who were the pioneers who, who set out first uh, a path by which we could be included. And we, we reset them in settings that are Americana, that are part of the the portraits that you might recognize if you went through the, the National Gallery and so forth, um, because we wanted to be able to say, look, this is again, part of our story. So I'm, I'm gonna stop here. I mean, there are a lot of other, um, you know, slides in this deck and I, I absolutely welcome you guys, hopefully to pick up the book if you can. Um, but, you know, a lot of what we wanted to do here is of course have a conversation and I'm gonna stop and hopefully we can have that. Um, so Paula, <laughs> first of all, Hi, good to see you. <laughs> yes, thank you for having this rogue uh, Harvard alum in on, on your guys' uh, <laughs> conversation here. Uh, and, uh, and I absolutely did wear this shirt as a bit of a uh, microaggression <laughs> color-wise. We are, we are inclusive at Yale. So <laughs> yes, yes, you are. Um, I, I want to add also that I'm so delighted, especially that this is co-sponsored by AACC. Uh, it really underscores the ways in which Yale has been so much more progressive and inclusive on especially that front, uh, helping to tell the story of Asian Americans and bring together Asian American students in ways that Harvard has still not done. And it's, it's I think, a mark of shame that, uh, that we have not taken advantage of the opportunity, actually, we have at, at Harvard to do the same. Uh, in fact, Yale's history uh, as part of the early era of Asian American development uh, is, is pretty deep. Yale was one, New Haven, Yale specifically, was one of the sites of, of the first uh, East Coast APA chapters actually in America. So it's not surprising to me that Yale is way ahead of us in that, in that sense. Um, so thank you guys for that more broadly. Um, but Paula, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the larger context of, of your book and First of all, why you decided to write it? Why now, in particular? And then, you know, we could talk a little bit about maybe some of the, the cascading implications of, of Vincent's life and death. Mm -hmm. Of course. Well, first of all, I would just say that, like, I'm in, I'm class of '91. I'm 53. I'm your classic Gen Xer. So I, I will say that um, I too heard about Vincent Chin when I was in college. Um, that was when the wonderful documentary uh, Who Killed Vincent Chin had come out, came out in the late 80s. And that's when I had first heard about it. And then uh, after I graduated, I went to Columbia to get my master's in journalism. And I was working as an intern at the Seattle Times. And in 1993, I got a job offer to be a feature writer at the Detroit News. And I remember the first thing that went through my head was, 
oh, well, my, the second thought, the first thought was, oh, Detroit News, what a great job opportunity. And then the second thought was Detroit, but what about Vincent Chin? Because he had just been killed barely a decade earlier. And in fact, all my other AAJA friends, uh, in fact, Jeff, I think you were one of them. You're like, Detroit, really? <laughs> Isn't that, are you gonna be safe there? Korean American girl from woman from uh, uh, Seattle with your Nissan, how, how, is this a good idea? I do wanna fast forward though and say that, Ultimately, moving to Detroit in 1993 was the best thing to happen to me because I met my future husband there and my future lifelong best friends. So I actually go back to Detroit every year since 1993. We haven't gone back since the pandemic, unfortunately, but we hope to go back to visit friends and family. And uh, for anyone who's from Detroit or Michigan and this Yale group, uh, I'm a Lafayette Coney dog girl. So I'm Lafayette, Team Lafayette. <laughs> so, um, and the Detroit people will understand what that means. But um, so yeah, so I, I definitely loved living um, in Detroit. So, but basically uh, I, if you do the math, that means I've known about Vincent Chin for more than half my life. To answer your question specifically about the book, what happened was in 27, uh, what was it, 2018, I was uh, just wrapping up one, because when I'm not writing books, I'm a TV writer, that's my day job. So I had wrapped up uh, working on one show and I was about to start being a writer on another show. And um, I had a few months off and so I wanted to maybe work on a, a passion project so I had time and my book agent and I were talking and I mentioned Vincent Chin because uh, after Trump was elected president in 2016, anti, uh, basically racist hate crimes, especially against Asians, started to rise. In Michigan alone, racist hate crimes against all people of color, including Asians, had tripled in 2017 alone. And Roland Huang and Jim Shimura, who were two of the lawyers and activists that were involved in helping this become a federal case, they were quoted in the Detroit News, my old alma mater, as saying, uh, uh, this is not good. This is Vincent Chin. And then that's when Vincent Chin's name came back. And he actually came back into the mainstream consciousness in 2017 when three on the three separate incident two separate incidents uh for two men and one man they were all indian american and they were all killed in hate crimes and there was an npr article where the indian american reporter said the indian community is wondering is this our indian american vincent chin moment so then his name started to pop up because of the because of trump because of racism and unfortunately now in hindsight we start to see the whole maga q and on all all that ugliness started to rise to the surface so I was talking to my book agent and she's like, oh my God, you have to write a narrative nonfiction book. And she specifically suggested young adult because as you can see from my books here, I specialize in writing nonfiction and fiction books about Asian American culture and people and topics for kindergarten through 12th grade. And I'd never written a young adult narrative nonfiction book before I've written novels. But uh, so I, was I realized my agent was right and that's kind of how it happened and it sold right away and it came out last year and uh, very grateful that it's it's done quite well it's won a bunch of awards uh, including being nominated for the National Book Awards so I'm very grateful for the reception of the book but that's that's it in a nutshell as to how this book came to be. One of the things which I really admired was in fact actually the fact that you chose to write this for a young adult audience it's underscores two things. You know, one is that our history is often not baked in as part of history, right? As part of the, the basic stories that we are told and we tell ourselves in classrooms as part of the curricula. And that actually begins really early on. I, I think recently we've seen a couple of states do this remarkable thing of, of making Asian American history mandatory as part of history teaching in general. But I don't remember ever learning about most of the things that we ended up actually putting into Rise uh, until college, right? It really was sort of like, oh, Chinese were here, they built railroads. There might have been some sort of scuffle in 1942 or something with Japanese people, which led to, oh, uh, you know, some kind of constitutional abrogation. And then basically, here we are in the present and Asians are all good. And I, I think that that coronavirus um, moment did a couple of things. The first is it really did underscore the fact that our history isn't just linear, it's cyclic, right? That a lot of the things we've seen before happen again and again. And you know what it is, you know? When you don't learn history, you are doomed to repeat it. And for us as Asian Americans, because people don't learn Asian American history, because we don't learn Asian American, his Asian American history, it feels often like we're doomed to repeat it. 
Um, that's a big reason why we decided to, to put together Rise, to write Rise. Um, the other thing though is this, uh, an element obviously of the, the horror of Vincent's killing is that, you know, even though again, some of the details are murky and will be lost till time, right? Um, there was a beat in which his killers misidentified him as, as being Japanese. And it, it really kind of underscored more broadly the fact that we as Asian Americans carry each other's weight, that there, there have been continuously uh, moments, purposefully, uh, I think, created moments in which the lines are blurred between our ethnicities. You know, if you are Indian, then you bear the weight of other South Asians. Uh, and, and Muslims and Arabs and other Middle Easterners, right? We saw that all during and, and after 9-11. Um, if you are East Asian or Southeast Asian, you bear the weight of all of the, the stereotypes and attacks and, and uh, hostility that emerge when those parts of the world are at war with the United States or those parts of the world are rivals to the United States. And during COVID, we saw that. We saw that sort of the, the pan-ethnic range of attacks that occurred, despite the fact that the, the primary hostility was being aimed at China, right? There isn't, people don't ask questions, check your, your ID, your, your nationality, your citizenship when they decide to actually attack. So those, those are things that, that are, I'm mindful of when I, when I uh, read your book and part of the reason why we want to include your, your particular narrative here. Oh, well, thank you so much, and congratulations again on Rise. I mean, it's it's a fantastic book, and uh, you know, it's it's both heartfelt, heartwarming, and and very poignant at times. You know, and I think I think it's very powerful. I'm I'm so proud of you. Um, so congratulations, and it's an honor to be a part of it. But I I will say I agree with you. I think um, one thing I do want to tell people that haven't read the book is that one of the things I hate as a children's book author and as a young adult novelist is when people think that it means that you simplify stuff or that you uh, kind of, it's a very patronizing attitude. Oh, that's so cute. I've always wanted to write a children's picture book. I'm like, they're really hard. I know they don't seem like it, but they're really hard. Um, you know, or, oh, young adult novel, when are you gonna write a real novel? And it's like, I, I don't sugarcoat the facts. And the one thing about this Vincent Chin book is that it's not just a simple historical retelling. You know, um, I'll, I'll actually show you, wait, if you have two seconds. Oh, I, have, <laughs> I have tons of binders. These are all the court transcripts. I went to Chicago National Archives, okay? I do, I'm a, I used to be a reporter. I do real investigative reporting. I have like five of these binders. I have 1200 pages from the federal trial. I um, interviewed people live. I, um, I, I interviewed many, many people that were involved in the case, both on the legal team, friends, family, and so forth. And my book also has new information. I met the son of Vicki Wong, who was supposed to get married to Vincent and her son's story is actually a parallel storyline in my book where I explore his shock because he didn't know about Vincent Chin until the 30th anniversary. He had no idea his mom was engaged to be married to one of the most infamous stories of anti-Asian violence and hate. And um, it's also about his journey trying to reach out to his mother because not only is not only are we silenced in our schools, even our own parents and grandparents and aunties and uncle kind of silenced the history as well, not on purpose, but really it was a form of survival because you think about our older generations, our elders, they came from a much more violent and uh, more volatile time period. I mean, we, we too have unfortunately, well, we're just as equally as violent today as we were back then, but um, the law wasn't on their side 40 years ago. And so we have a little bit of that advantage. I do want to address something too. Um, the, other, the other thing too is I've been saying a lot that we have to educate to erase the hate and why I'm grateful that New Jersey, Illinois, now New York and California, my own home state of Connecticut, they're starting to do this mandatory nuanced in-depth kindergarten through 12th grade Asian American Pacific Islander history classes to be taught. And the reason why that's important is you're, Jeff, you're right. We were always a sidebar. I mean, I was lucky if I got even a paragraph on the Japanese incarceration during World War II or, you know, and, and like there's like a little picture of, oh, by the way, and the Chinese, they helped build the railroad and then moving on. We're, we're, we're barely there. We're like a little bit of like, like, a you know, I don't know, just like, just like a little dollop of something. And, um, um, and I think that that angers me because 
when I went home, one of the stories I say is that I found an old box of my drawings from when I was a kid. And it was shocking to see the drawings I did because at first I'm Korean American, I had black hair, brown eyes. But as I went through the, the pages, I started drawing myself with blonde hair and blue eyes. And I realized, oh, that's because I was erased. I didn't read or know about our contributions in our history and our literature and, our, and, and in, in being, I wasn't taught any of this. We're all self-taught. And that's why I started writing these books because I didn't want kids to be erased like that. I didn't want kids to grow up and desperately go to that tiny little Asian history bookshelf at Barnes and Noble. Just going, I'm going to self-teach myself about the Korean War since nobody told me about it. So um, that's that's the reason uh, why why I do this. And um, uh, and I, I just want to add that the statistic that broke my heart last year. Um, because of the pandemic, and we'll talk a little bit about this as well. Uh, this is, I don't want to veer off this topic right now, but um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about how the pandemic affected my book. But um, one out of four Asian American Pacific Islander teenagers and children reported being physically, verbally harassed and bullied because of the coronavirus pandemic. And had our history been taught this whole time in depth, that number could have been zero. So we have to remember, you have to educate to erase the hate. Mm. I mean, wiser words, right? <laughs> Never spoken. But uh, I think that's something that you you bring up about that that kind of hall of mirrors that that you know media, entertainment, literature, history, uh, how it actually works with us is, on the one hand, if we don't see ourselves in those things, then we don't see ourselves at all. We we erase ourselves, and like so many other folks, you know, I, I also remember writing stories back when I was much, much younger, you know, and still kind of writing fiction <laughs> and, and finding it so hard to actually write stories with Asian American protagonists because I was just not used to thinking in that space. I, I was like, well, if I was going to, if I want to write this story, then I have to write the hero. The hero can't be Asian. The hero has to look like this. The hero has to, has to have these backgrounds. And uh, so even when I did write, I wrote it wrote fiction, right? I, I had to write um, fantasy or, or science fiction. I had to go very far away from a firsthand perspective because I, I felt like there was nothing there when I, I tried to write from a first person perspective. And it's something that when we talk to hundreds of people, you know, in-, in uh, hi, hi. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, when we talked to- No, what-, what? Sorry. <laughs> when we talked to it's hundreds of people, for uh, the book, for Rise, you know, writers, uh, filmmakers, actors, um, academics, uh, entrepreneurs, there was so much of that same thing, that feeling like you, you almost had to see this label of being Asian American as, uh, I don't want to say like a handicap, but certainly as something that in the 90s and in the 2000s especially felt like it puts you in a category that was niche, that was off to the side, marginal, and that couldn't, you know, it, it kind of limited you from, from being the protagonist in your own story. Uh, certainly, you know, in, in the workplace that evolved into lots of conversations, especially, in, you know, we're both journalists or recovering journalists, right? Uh, I remember so many people who would say things like, oh yeah, I'm a journalist who happens to be Asian American, but I really don't see myself as an Asian American journalist. I don't want to be, I don't want to be um, labeled as such or boxed in as such. I, I'm an investigative reporter. I'm a sports writer. I'm yeah, an entertainment journalist, a, criti a cultural critic. But if I say that I'm Asian American up front, then that means that the things that I can talk about and write about are limited in these ways. And as somebody who wanted to write about being Asian American, who was really excited about this emergent culture coming out of college, uh, when I started out my journalistic career, I, I remember uh, people warning me not to be too Asian, right, in, in newsrooms. And uh, as a result, the very first story I covered uh, as a cultural critic was a, a, a short review on Balinese shadow puppetry. <laughs> uh, even though I was, I had nothing to do with you know, of course, uh, Bali, Indonesia had no knowledge of, of the art itself, but because no one else wanted to cover it. And, you know, the arts editor was like, oh, you know, uh, somebody should do something about this. Hey, you know what? We'll throw it to you, Jeff. 
I, I felt firsthand what it what that meant, right? To be told, oh, the Asian guy, give it to the Asian guy, right? So it wasn't quite like this was without fire. The smoke was there and the, the reality was, yes, we did often get kind of pushed over to the side as Asian Americans because we weren't seen as mainstream. But some of the outcomes of that absolutely were, you know, a result of, of almost fear of being put into that label because of things like what happened to Vincent. If we are associated with that, if we were seen as Asian, that could happen to us. It was almost like a self-defense thing. And it breaks my heart hearing this today too, just because it's, oh, I don't want to be limited to the Asian reporter or the Asian writer because that's going to be limiting. It's like, why didn't we think of that as, that's incredibly freeing. Why would it, you know, there are like a billion people in China alone. Like, let's, you know what I mean? It's like, there's <laughs> how many cultures are there? Music, like what, this it's just incredibly freeing. It should, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't box you in, no, but, and, and so that's the irony too. And, and one thing I did want to add was in addition to, uh, our faces, our stories and everything not really being taught in school or being present on screen. Like, I mean, it was 25 years between the Joy Luck Club and Crazy Rich Asians. You know, it's been a quarter of a century since uh, Margaret Cho and All American Girl. And of course, you know, with your son uh, fresh off the boat on TV, you know, it, it's <laughs> many, many years that go by. And, and I think that what people forget too, though, is that there actually were amazing Asian American uh, and Pacific Islander writers from the 60s and 70s, Lawrence Yep, Dragon Wings, which actually is in the news again because it's getting banned because of all the hysteria over uh, book banning. Uh, that's a whole other topic, but he won the Newbery Honor Medal in 1975. I was in the first grade. I never heard of his book until my 30s. And, and this is the book that when you win the Newbery, you get that little silver or gold seal. So every time you saw a book like that in your elementary school library, you knew you would have to write a book report on it because it's the good book. It's got the seal on it. He has one of those seals, 1975. Never saw it in my elementary school. So it's also, it's not that we were being forcibly silenced and erased. It's also that there was no access. There was no distribution. And, and that's also, an, and that also goes back to, Think about white supremacy and systemic racism. Who are the gatekeepers? Yeah. Who's preventing our stories from being told and being taught and just existing in the same space? And then of course, because of that, that's why we thought it would be too limiting to be an Asian journalist when that could have been the most freeing thing you could have ever done and has been because you've been such an, a, a, such an iconic and, and smart um, uh, cultural columnist for all things Asian American. So, you know, I mean, I, I so that, that I like, I get, oh, I'm getting angry. <laughs> this just fires me <laughs> Let's go protest. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's definitely room and time for that, uh, especially now. God. Uh, so, um, Liz tells me that uh, we should probably go to questions now. I think there probably are things people want to share. So, I'll, I'll toss it back to her and, uh, and let's keep that going. Great. Thank you, you guys. Thanks for such a, 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 a deep but very thoughtful and entertaining um, discussion, right, as, as well as an informative. Um, so I have some, some writing specific questions. Um, this is to Paula, just because um, I think, right, it's really important to point out that um, writers do do a lot of research, even if it's uh, young adult stuff, right? So uh, what's the process for distilling all the amazing research you do um, to, to what's pertinent for the book? And um, does the research come first or do you already kind of have a direction of your narrative um, when you're, you're doing the research? Those are fantastic questions. And to answer them is that I did have a basic idea of where I wanted to go because also my other background is as a screenwriter and novelist. So I often tell stories very naturally as a storyteller. I have a three act structure. I mean, even as a reporter, I wasn't the hard news reporter. I was, I was the fluffy feature writer. So I always did profiles <laughs> and feature length type stories. So it's always just been a natural way for me to tell stories. So I had a basic path of what I thought would be the first act, the second act, and the, you know, the third act being the trial and the aftermath and things like that. But in terms of reporting, as you saw with those heavy binders, what kept me from getting overwhelmed, and it's also happening right now with my new book, which I'm happy to talk about as well, was it's emotion, emotion, emotion. Any fact that I read or any piece of testimony in the court trial that moved me, that also reflected 
the, the person that I was writing about, the characters, because every character, whether it's nonfiction or fiction, has a journey. A character has its want, they have, they have their want or need, their desire, their goal, and then there's an obstacle that prevents them from achieving that goal. How do they overcome that obstacle if they overcome it or if they don't? What have they learned and how have they grown and changed for, forever? and hopefully for the better at the end of their journey. So every single page of testimony I read, every single fact that I read, every population census uh, demographic that I read, um, you know, all the books that I read, the newspaper articles, it always went back to how did this affect Gary losing his best friend, his childhood best friend? How did this affect Vicki who lost the love of her life? How did this affect the defense attorney who was getting death threats for defending the killer? You know, so in other words, it was always it's always about emotion and a character's journey. And that's what I think people forget that nonfiction is just as vital and exhilarating and exciting as fiction. I love that. Um, we, we did an event last year, too, where um, we had a lot of alumni, you know, want to share stories about their families, immigrant stories, and a lot of people are inspired to to do oral histories and interview their parents. And so um, I, I really love that you, you did that research and, um, you know, it, 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 that event, and I hope hopefully this event, right, will we'll have folks um, think about, you know, their, their family story and how they fit into um, American history. And so um, I, I want to take us to um, a last question. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, you guys talked a lot about um, the, the context of like these these books. Um, in the past two years, we have seen uh, a dramatic increase in anti-Asian incidents, uh, whether they're microaggressions or uh, really violent acts. Um, so a lot of folks here, I mean, I don't know if we'll, you know, we'll be able to like uh, pinpoint uh, an answer, but folks kind of want to know, um, you know, what, what you think is is the answer or like how how you are addressing um, the rise in anti-Asian hate. Um, what I will also do is um, drop a link of resources for folks. Um, so last year on the IA board um, put together uh, a statement and um, like a, a web page of resources because uh, President Salovey and a lot of community folks um, uh, put out statements. We, we, we collated statements and we also put together community resources. Um, so I'm, I dropped that in the chat for people um, looking for, um, you know, personal resources and whatnot. Um, also, feel free to to reach out. Um, but wanted to to give you guys a, an opportunity to talk about um, how um, you know maybe you're you're working to to put this in curricula or um, you know just what you're doing on a personal level. I think that in a in the broadest possible sense, the work that uh, that Rise has been doing that uh, Paula has been doing, frankly, in her whole career, not just in this book, has been about bringing human perspectives, three-dimensionality to Asians in the media and in, in entertainment. And in a lot of ways, when we talk about the, the ways in which racism works, it, it works first by dehumanizing us, by flattening us, by making us into not fellow people, not, not people we can uh, engage with on an intimate, on a, a compassionate level, but rather as cartoons, as caricatures, as, as stereotypes, because that's easier to dismiss when things happen to us. It's easier to walk away when we're seen as, as uh, you know, something less than human. So I think that the, the bigger work of what we are, we're doing is just constantly trying to ensure that there are stories that we're telling that we have agency over out there in the world around us and whether you know paula in your books or in the tv work that you're doing you've always pushed hard to make sure that there are asian american faces voices you know stories embedded into these narratives and in a not so secret way i think that's incredibly important i think that just feeling like people come into your home that don't look like you perhaps, that have different traditions, faiths, and histories, that those people are still people is, is almost revolutionary in this last half decade of our Asian American existence. No, and thank you again. I do appreciate that. And, and it's right back at you because we, we've, Jeff and I have known each other since 1993. <laughs> so I think our, our 30th or 40th, uh, 30th anniversary is coming up next year. We'll have to, uh, we'll have to go to Vegas or something. But, um, but 
to answer this question, just bring up a couple of points. I was taking some notes. Um, I, I wanted to say history will always repeat itself, as Jeff said earlier, because look, we're human and human people are ultimately lazy. It's so much easier to pass the buck, to gaslight someone else than to do the hard work of looking inward and asking yourself, what did I do wrong? How can I how can I resolve that? How can I be accountable? How can I uplift others and, and learn? For, you know, it's because I think the problem with racism is we often think of it as good versus evil. And that's and that's why I think a lot of people get up in arms like, oh, I'm not racist because they think it means evil. And yes, racism is evil. But if you commit an act of racism, that's when it gets more, there's a more nuanced conversation that needs to happen. And speaking of that, uh, the two other, two other quick points I want to bring up that I think will hopefully answer this question is, first of all, uh, my book has an afterword about the pandemic because in uh, May of 2020, my publisher called and said, Paula, you got to write a you got to write an afterword comparing what's happening right now to Vincent Chin. So I wrote an afterword and I wrote it in May and the, the first line was, as I write this, more than 100,000 Americans have died from COVID-19. It killed me. I cried every time I got another edit and I had to cross out that number and add in it. I think it was up to 400 by the time the book went to print. And in fact, one of the people I interviewed died from COVID right before my book came out, Corky Lee, the famous Chinese American photographer who took all the pictures of the protests in Detroit for Vincent Chin. And he became part of that statistic. And I, and so, and what I'm bringing up is that when Atlanta happened uh, last year with the mass shootings, my phone ran off the hook, rang off the hook and suddenly my book kind of went viral right before it was about to be published. And um, I did not get any sleep that week because people were constantly calling me for interviews. And I started thinking about the people, the loved ones who were left behind in Atlanta. And I remembered when I interviewed people for my Vincent Chin book, every single person I talked to, a lot of them cried or they got angry again. And I realized they weren't remembering what happened, they were reliving it. I was, I was witnessing PTSD happen in front of me, but they weren't just reliving the horror of what had happened to Vincent. They were also reliving the moment that they were told, you don't count, this wasn't a racist hate crime. You don't count, you don't have a seat at the table. And all I can tell you is whoever does the book 40 years from now in Atlanta, the loved ones will also cry because they were told in March of 2021, killer was having a bad day. This is probably just a crime of misogyny has not, <laughs> women, Asian American women, you don't experience misogyny alone. It's always rooted in racism. There's intersectionality. So it happened all over again. But I will say that the best thing about history repeating itself is so does hope. You know, people fought and rose up and handed out those flyers to march for justice for Vincent Chin. Same thing happened today, but there's a new thing that happened. Rihanna and Megan Thee Stallion donated over $100,000 to the loved ones in Atlanta. You know, we are now doing, I have posters that say Koreans for Black Lives. You know, the Koreans have that phrase, Black Lives are precious, you know? And, and I just wanna say that the next, the way we can keep history from repeating itself so much is not only by having hope, but also doing solidarity. We need to team together with other communities. We have to also, we, Jeff and I can, we can all talk about anti-Asian racism for another two hours, but we're just talking to an echo chamber. We're just saying the same things over and over. I have to say Black Lives Matter. I have to say LGBTQIA, my pronouns, you know, she, her. I have to fight against Islamophobia. I have to fight against anti-Semitism, body shaming, you know, like let's, let's listen and support other communities because we will not get through and stop this hate if we don't fight for each other and with each other. So I think solidarity is the next step in terms of also not just donating to Asian American groups, but also to black groups, to LGBTQ youth groups and, and so forth. So, and I will just wrap up by saying that's the theme of my next book, which is coming out uh, next year from Norton. It's called Rising from the Ashes and it's about Sa Igu, which was uh, uh, the 1992 Los Angeles uprising, which was known back then as the LA riots, and it's going to be told from the point of view of uh, Koreatown and the Korean and Black communities. So. I love if that. I can, yeah. if I can throw out uh, the next project I'm working on actually right as we speak, in fact, um, so uh, in, in that broader context of looking back at our kind of pop cultural history, that Hall of Mirrors, um, I was actually asked to take on the task of writing uh, a, a photo book actually called The Golden Screen, 
which uh, has as a subtitle, The Movies That Made Asian America. So it is it's gonna be a book about, uh, I think right now it's about 118 movies that uh, are both Asian, Asian American and Hollywood movies that help to kind of shape the way that we see ourselves. And uh, it's been really incredible just diving back into that, that entertainment history and what it's meant to us. So thanks guys so much for having me. And I really enjoyed this conversation as always. Sure. Thank well, my you. favorite people, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paula. Thanks. Thanks. Such a such a lovely conversation, and and um, you know, really good points to end on. Um, I I love that you know Paula ended on a note of solidarity, um, which is something that um, I think all of us right have have had to re rely on in the past two years, right, with with the murder of George Floyd and the anti Asian. Um, hate like I think they they go hand in hand and so I I love that you have that that perspective um and and that's why um for folks wondering I mean our statement talks a lot about that too right and talk about the um, addressing the blackness and how our, our liberation is rooted um and and I love that you mentioned that Jeff to your project um I, I know will have such an impact because the pandemic has also had um, a really um, negative impact on the mental health of, of a lot of our Asian American youth um, so again, this is why, right, like telling their stories and making sure, you know, people understand like there's where they come from and there's pride in who they are and their identity is so important. Um, so thank you for that. And with that, I'm, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Dini to close out for us. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, again, and Paula so much for just sharing your heart with us and your work with us. Um, you know, so much of what you said resonated with me as well and the work that we do at the Asian American Cultural Center. Um, by no means do we want to say that Harvard is behind, but you know we're doing what we can also to support um, to ensure that students at Harvard will get their space and get their space. Um, and that's so critical. And so with that, um, I just really want to thank everyone for being here with us. There will be a recording of this event that will be shared in a couple of days. Um, and I also want to share the link to the ACC website if any of you are interested in learning more about the work that we do and how to support as alumni or just in general as um, public folks. But I just really hope that all of you take time to care for yourselves as well. This These past two years and the ongoing pandemic have not been easy in any way. And I know I, fi I found so much healing and solace in just being in community. Um, so I hope that as we continue to do the good work that we're also creating spaces um, just for joy, uh, cultivating of that amongst one another and to remember to be fueled by love and respect um, for for all humankind. So we just really um, appreciate all of you in the chat box and in this Zoom room. And um, we just hope to see you in a future event, whether in person or virtual. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>